Hello everyone, this is the Mint uh, Budget Roundtables and we're going to be discussing technology for financial inclusion and just a couple of quick data points that we need to think about. We all know that uh, digital payments have gone up and gone up sharply over the last few years. At the same time, we are also seeing reports that financial inclusion has risen. It's a, there's a new financial inclusion that has been set up by the RBI and that is showing a 24% jump. So naturally, uh, sometimes Co correlation doesn't always cause ca causation, but in this case, you have to wonder, is, is technology helping with financial inclusion? Is the fact that uh, a, just about everyone seems to have a mobile phone and many of them now have got Jandan accounts, is that a factor that is actually helping? And if so, what else can be done? Is new technology, the fintech revolution that's happening, is it going to continue to help financial inclusion? Are there certain specific areas where a lot more work can be done and where assistance is required, such as financial credit, for example? That's one of the obvious places where maybe inclusion hasn't gone as far as it could. Women entrepreneurs, places like areas like that uh, may, may well be where the government needs to, uh, to uh, address some attention. So we're going to get some panelists to come on, tell us exactly what is happening right now. These are the top experts in the field, what has been happening till now, and what perhaps is it that the finance minister should keep in mind when she is presenting the budget and after that. So let me start by welcoming our uh, very special guest, Tara Subramaniam is joining us. She's director, JM Financial, but is also the president of the of Naredko Mahi, which is specifically looking at women entrepreneurs and a lot of uh, the activity that's taking place there. Bindu Anand, great to have you with us, the chair and managing trustee at the Dwara Holding. She's also uh, written a book, uh, uh, on, uh, co-edited a book on financial engineering for low-income uh, households. So, so great to have you with us. Rishi Gupta is the MD of Fino Paytech. And uh, 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 Natasha Jethanandani also joining us, CTO at Keredo Finn. So thank you all so much uh, for being with us. Let me just start by getting on maybe perhaps all your opening uh, comments on this. Uh, I, I began by talking about the two trends that we seem to be seeing. There, there does seem to be an improvement in financial inclusion, and there's definitely a big surge when it comes to the use of technology and fintech. Uh, am I correct in correlating the two? Is there a causation between one and the other? Uh, and and, and uh, uh, if so, what do you think have been the defining features of the last few years that have really driven any rise in financial inclusion that we could be seeing? Uh, Taraji, why don't I start with you? What are you seeing? I think there has been a great amount of um, financial inclusion and, uh, you know, digitalization has taken us very, very much uh, forward. And uh, with contactless payments that are being done now, at home consumption alone has a potential of about 3 trillion market by about 2025. This is on various accounts because of the kind of banking systems, both the private and public bank uh, digitalization, people using uh, mobiles, people using all kinds of tab tables, tablets. I think this is really going to be great. And also banking has gone into interiors. Of course, a lot more needs to be done. Uh, you know, the, the fallback or the uh, deterrence or the challenges we can talk later, but the advantages is also uh, because of post-pandemic, I think a lot of people want to do cashless transactions because they don't want to even handle cash. And I think one of the most driving forces to increase this uh, payment, um, uh, cashless payment is demonetization. That has given a huge amount of trust to the economy. Did uh, and you you feel that demonetization did help in that, or is the other two not linked? See, digital payment was always there, Vikram, but I think demonetization has just taken it a le little level above, because what happened is people realized at for, for some time. See, we're all people of uh, habits. We're all creatures of habits. So, you know, we're all becoming more sensitive about not handling cash, not keeping cash at home, using digital payments wherever possible. You have all your vendors, whether it is your Kirana Wala, whether your Fruit Fellow, they're all building their credit um, history by being more digital. So I think demonetization has, in that one aspect, has helped the digitalization of payments. Yes. All right. Uh 
Bindu, if I could just turn to you next. Now, uh, you know, you've been you've been on RBI committees on financial inclusion, you know, housing securitization and other things. RBI has, for example, I'm just giving a data point out there, says that 24% improvement in financial inclusion uh, between, let's say, March 2017 and March 2021. 24% uh, jump seems, seems good. Is that... Anecdotally, also, what you're seeing on the ground, and would you perhaps get get to share any further light on that sort of a number? What's driving it? Yeah, no, sure, Vikram. I think first of all, you know, there's clearly been phenomenal progress in the last, you know, I would say decade or so, um, and we see that reflected on the ground. We see that in the numbers. You know, just one data point: we went from about you know half the country having a bank account maybe six, seven years ago, to now 90% uh, having a bank account. A bank account is not everything, but it's a great starting point to think about what else might be possible. Um, so clearly progress. Um, and to me, the defining sort of feature, what is making some of this possible, I think the best is yet to come for sure. Uh, but it's really the investments that we've made in public infrastructure. Uh, so specifically, the India stack, Aadhaar, KYC, uh, UPI, um, and this is a path that I think India has uniquely taken compared to, uh, for example, countries in East Africa have also done very well in payments, but that's been driven by one or two companies. But here we've taken sort of a public uh, goods uh, approach to infrastructure, which is really letting uh, many flowers bloom. Um, and so I think that to me is the most significant uh, policy feature, what we've done, not demonetization, not jandan, but it's really the public infrastructure build uh, that's in progress. Um, and I will just say, and I hope we talk more about this, if you double click on the 90% account ownership, you know, growth in payments, et cetera, there are underlying kind of fault lines, there are divides. There is, as you would expect, a gender gap. Um, women are not transacting as much uh, as men. Uh, there is an urban rural, uh, that is true of almost everything in the country, uh, but the acceptance infrastructure in rural versus urban. Um, so lots of things to be done, uh, but I would say great start and a lot of momentum. Okay, uh, Natasha, let me, let me get you in on that note then. Um, so two practically different theses. One, uh, I think what Bindu is saying is that the digital infrastructure is really built out and specifically the India stack. The fact that there are a range of different technologies all seamlessly interacting with each other, that's really what has driven uh, change. Um, it is possible that the, that the jam trinity, you know, having the Jandhan accounts, having Aadhaar, having mobile phones in everyone's hand is helping in that, but it's the entire India stack. And the fact that we've been able to set up an India stack that's what's driving dramatic change. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. I think, um, I, you know, resonate with many of the points that the previous panelists have raised. Uh, fully feel like that public goods investment has gone a long way. I think uh, there are things we can do today uh, that we could not do earlier. And I think that combined with, you know, increased mobile phone penetration is really helping. But I think also, while I think there is so much positive uh, movement here, I think, uh, you know, one of the things we notice at Kaleidofin on the ground is um, that, you know, there are, uh, you know, fault lines also, as, as Bindu referred to. So there are certain, I mean, I think we could do some interesting tweaks here not massive changes, but tweaks to also enable, for example, the Jam Trinity to perform better for the rural customer or the informal sector customer. So just to give you an example, you know, today, I think it's very important for your bank account uh, to have your Aadhaar card and your uh, mobile number to also be tied with your Aadhaar card. Now, many of these customers in the financial inclusion world do change their phones, they change their SIM cards, as you can imagine. And then it becomes a process to go and apply that to your Aadhaar number or to update your bank account to reflect that mobile number as well as that Aadhaar. So I think just simpler, you know, setups where, for example, these three could be architecturally tied up so that it was much easier from a process perspective for a rural customer to say, you know, have these three connected would just make a huge difference for, uh, in all of their setup uh, to be available for any kind of uh, financial product. 
And I think, you know, another interesting example is UPI, for example. It has transformed India's digital payments, as we all know. Uh, but I think when we double click into it, it's also done. There's so much volume of payments, as Tara mentioned. But I think also we're trying to see the number of customers. And I think the number of unique customers on it is still around 125 uh, plus uh, million. But that's very far from the entire population of India. Few challenges there, like, uh, you know, you need a debit card, for example, to set up your UPI handle. And many banks in rural areas don't issue a debit card to customers physically. Uh, and so how do you now get your debit card pin to set up that initial ID? Again, I think very solvable problems. In fact, I think there are huge steps being taken here to also enable UPI on feature phones, which we we are so happy about. Uh, so I think all going in the right direction. And I think, you know, uh, just want to see how we can make those appropriate tweaks to make this even more accessible. Right. Rishi, uh, getting you in on this. Um... Are we overstating the role that technology is playing in, in all of this? I mean, at the end of the day, uh, is are most people still uh, interacting financially with using old traditional methods, the old big banks, the old ways of doing it, the old way of you know going to your branch? Is that still the dominant force? Or increasingly, is, is technology now leapfrogging? What, what's your sense of the overall landscape first? See, I have seen this... Uh play out for the last 15 years and I must say there has been a lot of improvement which has happened uh, especially in the last five to seven years I don't see there is one shoe which is going to fit all it's going to be a model where you will have people come physically as well as people come digitally so if we are assuming that India will become it's going to be a zero one game that everybody will come physically or will come digitally I don't think so those uh, that scenario will come or be relevant for India com compared to some of the global economies which we are seeing. Even there, we have started to see physical coming back in a big way. We have also started to see some of the online companies starting to offline uh, as well uh, and uh, getting into physical stores and uh, access. Because when we are looking at the entire 1.3 billion population of the country, we can't expect everybody to be on mobile phone and uh, also everybody to do transactions. It's not about having mobile phone and network. It is around the safety and the convenience of doing transactions also on mobile phone. I saw my co-panelists talk about 125 million UPI or people doing mobile transactions. I think that's a big growth which we are seeing. If we are expecting the entire billion population to be on mobile, I don't think so. That is going to be there. So my view, Chandra, is uh, that it's going to be a mix of physical and digital, which we call digital in a way. Let me let me share some examples uh, with you. When we started 15 years back, there was no identity in the country. We had power issues. We had network issues. Uh, it was completely a different model. We worked on an offline smart card based solution where we used to capture the photographs, the fingerprints and carry a suitcase uh, in which we had all the laptops and the screens and we used to take photographs and open an account. I think those days have got past. Uh, the technology has really made it convenient uh, for the bankers as well as for the consumers to come onto the platform. We have started to see a huge jump on uh, on the ecosystem where people are moving away from branches. Now, when people move away from branches and ATM, it doesn't mean that they need to come to a digital channel only. There is in a there is a kind of a, another channel called the merchant channel where or the BC channel and. Uh, I remember you had covered in one of your programs uh, many years back as well, in which uh, we are able to set up an ecosystem of merchants. There are somewhere around 10 lakh, uh, maybe 15 lakh merchants who are on the banking platform with who can give access to consumers to do come and do transactions on that platform. So that is completely technology driven, but it is an assisted model. So in India, we believe uh, the model which will really work is the assisted model. Uh, when we started also our bank five years back, uh, we started with a branch model, then we moved to a merchant model. And now we have uh, nearly 8 lakh uh, merchants uh, who use our platform to give banking access to millions of customers across the country. We are pre present in more than 90% of the districts in the country. So having said that, I think that's the right model where technology is able to reach the last mile. But will technology be useful for the person to use this in his hand or he will go to a local shop where he can be assisted to do a transaction, make it possible for him to do banking. Right. 
so i think that is where the revolution is happening uh, end of the day what we need to see is that whether we can make access to banking so convenient and cheap and easy for the customer and, that whether he right. on his own or he do through the ecosystem he is able to do the transactions well and i thought the entire revolution around jam npc all right. the rails which so, the infrastructure has got the last few years is helping us to grow technology to reach the last mile all right let me let me take that point and throw it open to everybody then and uh, there's an interesting point that arises from that so number 1 can we anticipate that technology will actually reach everybody right if you want if you want financial inclusion for all indians is it going to get to everyone tier 3 tier 4 villages which still don't have mobile and 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 and, and the internet a smaller number but they are still people i mean, we've got what something like 42 crore uh, jandhan accounts 116 crore mobile hand, uh, mobile phone connections out there so i want to get everyone's take first eventually is it your belief that the india stack or technology or digital payments and all of this can actually reach every single indian tier 3 tier 4 rural india remote villages everywhere within 4 5 years it should be possible to get digital payments to everybody let me get everyone's quick view on that tarat tarat let me start with you what's your sense vikram i think if you have and reach every household that should be forget about each person every okay. household each can household have that time, yeah. i think that would be a great thing and yes it is going to take time you know there is a revolution and everything that happens takes a little time in india being also such a vast place and so many people and another main important is a lot of them need to be made aware of what it is and many of these forms and instructions have to be given in their vernacular languages see that's another thing that we are going to have a problem not yeah. everybody reads hindi english or main languages so you know dialects are different so that needs to be very very carefully addressed i think over a period of maybe 5 to 7 years i can see households having um yes this uh, advantage yes okay so potentially very it shouldn't be difficult to get the india stack or get digital payments to at least every household within a relatively short period of time but yes people need to be educated uh, that in that's if i could sum up what you're saying on how it works bindu your sense of that yeah i mean i'm optimistic also about this uh, but you know kind of i would make two additional points one that the on ramp to digital payments will look different for people for a lot of us uh, for a lot of people it is likely to be the direct benefit transfer in one shape or form that is that is probably going to be the first exposure to digital payments for many others it's going to be a merchant payment in the city uh, but one way or the other people are going to interact with this infrastructure and then i think the challenge for us is to say how can we take that starting point because let's be clear it's only a starting point um and convert that into more meaningful financial inclusion uh, so whether you have come in through dbt or come in through uh, a merchant payment uh, can we then use that interaction to build other layers such as access to credit access to savings um because that's the end goal right payments not equal to financial inclusion it's a great starting point right Natasha, um, is it is it easier to get the infrastructure to everybody than to educate people how to use it well? Absolutely, absolutely is, and I think you hit the nail on you know uh, hit the hammer on the nail. I should say. I think uh, uh, you know we've already got fantastic mobile phone penetration, right? I think uh, over four hundred and fifty million plus. I think about three hundred million plus in rural areas. but i think a statistic i read recently was that only 13% of them have ever done any kind of transaction uh online uh they are using it for other purposes of course uh, but they are not uh, and this is with internet connectivity there's of course a lot more feature phone usage and so i think uh, you know within that the number of financial transactions is much much lower and i think uh, you know i would really uh, agree that the path to this is partly getting uh, connectivity and access to the household but i think the assisted channel and the assisted mode is going to be a very interesting way and i think a much more scalable way to be able to educate and uh, you know i think 
when a customer might do does this through an assisted mode say the first time or the first few times i think then to take it home and adopt it within the household with maybe that one person in the household who does have a smartphone i think is a more interesting and scalable way to reach uh you know the entire population and so big supporter of the assisted mode i think we also employ it everywhere you know it's sort of a touch trusted model uh, that also greatly leverages technology uh, but you know i think again all the frameworks that we're designing at a central level need to then support assisted mode so how can you know how do we set up upi in an assisted mode how do we account aggregators are amazing you know new framework coming out how do we again enable that in an assisted mode we're actually working with semathi as we speak uh and hoping to collaborate uh and we're already co collaborating with them to see how to make assisted mode a reality here so i do think you know again how to design that in in each of these frameworks is going to be critical right um i'm now going to try and translate some of what we are discussing into you know policy recommendations or something with the finance minister to keep in mind so drawing from what all of you have have just been saying uh Rishi, it seems very clear that there is a very clear message coming across that we've we've spoken about the digital divide, and obviously, if you're talking about financial inclusion, you shouldn't have a digital divide. But what I'm hearing from all of you is that the divide need not necessarily only be access to the India stack or to digital payments. It's also digital literacy, being aware, being knowing how to use that device or use a particular service is actually. as crucial so one of the things perhaps which the government and everyone else should be thinking about is how do you spread that awareness how do you make sure everyone understands and sometimes with the best of intent you can make the things a little bit more complicated like for example the rbi has now given a bit more time but some of the things that were being spoken about how do you automate payments for example how do you tokenize your card with uh, with, with people sometimes these things become even more complicated like i can't tell you how many people have called me up and saying what does this mean why is it this how do i get my payments up and running they don't understand it and to be honest it took me some and i sort of spent some time scratching my head and saying how does this, how do you get this to work so if that's what's happening here in 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 cities if people who consider themselves digitally literate it could probably create a lot of lot of chaos elsewhere so how do we spread information how do we make sure that all of this is relatively simple to use i could have come to how it could be misused but let's let's come to that later rishi so uh, yeah vikram uh, my own two cents on this is uh, first of all i would say that technology is already le reached the last mile it's not that technology is not there a person using the uh, mobile phone uh, for transactions also about talks about his awareness as you are rightly saying and also about the safety and grievance handling some of the one big thing which we miss out when we look at digital is that digital interactions are also only on digital platforms you do chatbot you do emails and all the population in india especially the the bottom uh, half of the population may not be comfortable connecting on digital if there is a grievances so technology i don't think so inclusion uh, is uh, handicapped because of technology or the rails or the infrastructure or the networks it is there we are there we see that happening we are seeing people coming to our platforms uh, roughly about 20 million 25 million people come our platforms every month we do more than 2 billion dollars of transactions every month so it is it is happening on the ground so one we need to keep clear on this that technology has not reached the last mile technology has reached the last mile it is only whether people want to do it in assisted mode or do it yourself mode so something which i said earlier i believe assisted mode and i also heard natasha uh, who is also seems to be promoting assisted uh, is that assisted is the manner in which you can target the 7 800 million people in the country who may not try to do it on their own now coming to awareness and i think awareness and grievances and the fact that ability to navigate uh, the transaction is something which will happen over a period of time personally i believe we need to give time to the people to get used to digital we need to give time to people to understand we have seen and we have seen a big jump in our upi volumes to our surprise also when we started to help the customer navigate on our upi platform through our merchant we saw 
the uh, the usage of UPI going up on a month to month basis much higher than the growth which we are seeing in the country a yeah, much much higher growth on that okay. so people use uh, platforms so if they are assisted in some form what I have seen and I'll give you one example the government really promoted the insurance uh, if you remember a couple of years back that 12 rupees 365 rupees so everybody is aware of those insurance platforms so government has done an excellent job in terms of creating awareness around digital and inclusion uh, of uh, financial services. So I think we are on the right track. Uh, we just need to keep on uh, building up. I think over a period of time, as people will get comfortable, they will start using mobile phones to do transactions. Uh, right now, they are comfortable to move away from branches to assisted. Over a period of time with assistance, uh, they will move to mobile phones also. But if we are assuming the entire country will become mobile friendly on financial transactions, uh, we are already seeing a uh, lot of people using Facebook, uh, from Facebook, and even people using Twitter uh, in rural India. So people have started to use digital platforms for social media and for video streamings, but yeah. they have still not moved to do financial transactions because financial transactions are more complex thing to do and especially grievance handling is something which we don't uh, talk about rbi talks about it quite a bit they talk about they put a central ombudsman also now so grievance handling is a big issue which is there when it comes to digital awareness is another big issue which needs to be catered to okay i think that can be handled through a uh, through a physical and a digital ecosystem which can get created uh, through uh, multiple platforms like banks nbfcs fintechs uh, uh, right. payments banks small finance banks so i think that we are on we are on the right track i i personally i would say that people have started to use it uh, we don't need to over engineer it we just need to happen it it, it is a flow which will happen over a right of it's a flow that will happen don't don't push it too fast when the faculty has turned to you you know sometimes like for example if you look at what the rbi one of the things that i've been been, been uh, was just referring to if you look at the rbi for example it's clearly there could be bad actors out there. There could be people trying to steal people's credit card. There could be, there's a certain desire to have protection. The issue can be sometimes if you complicate it too much or if it becomes too difficult to manage, that actually throws up windows with people who are not entirely financial literate. People <clears throat> can take advantage of it. Now it's, it's tougher to do. We've actually in the country been able to fix certain things. Our OTP based, you know, people will say, we don't need to overthink this because you do have OTP based verification which is pretty advanced and most people figure it out. So somewhere, how do you how do you go the, the walk that tightrope between yeah. wanting to protect people and then yet if you try too hard to protect people, you can make it so complicated that now people are not understanding how to use it and that throws open possible gaps which bad actors can misuse. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, you know, I think on balance, our bias should be towards given the, you know, state of financial inclusion, in the country, we should be obsessed about access and letting people, you know, experience services, um, you know, for sure. And agree with a lot of what Rishi was saying that this is a learning by doing kind of uh, problem. It's not, you can't sit on the sidelines and think about how you will do a transaction. Um, this is something people will learn. Many of these services are very intuitive. Having said that, you will make mistakes. You know, I think about the WhatsApp delete a message feature. That's fantastic, right? I mean, so the challenge in a lot of digital transactions is there is a concern, you know, a lot of our customers tell us that if I make a mistake in the offline world, I can go tell that LIC agent, Are galti kar diya, just reverse that. Is there reversibility in the digital world? Um, if I make mistakes, how do I make sure that these mistakes are not too costly? And I think that's where regulation has to be really focused. So let a lot of entry happen. Don't make a, don't, you know, um, keep a lot of entry barriers that are preventing uh, people from coming in innovating, but be very focused on what we call regulating conduct of all players, whether they are banks, non-banks, Indian apps, Chinese apps, right? These are just artificial categories, but the core job of the regulator is to make sure that the customer is protected. Um, and I think what we are not doing enough from a policy standpoint is we are over engineering, you know, how much capital should you have as an NBFC? What can you do? What you can't do? 
and we are under uh, investing vis-a-vis -vis, um, what should you have in terms of Rishi spoke about grievance redressal. Uh, and before it even goes to the RBI ombudsman, if you are a financial institution, if you're doing anything that affects a retail customer, you have to have strong internal grievance redress. And it's only if that doesn't work that it should go to the RBI. Um, so I think in general, policy should sort of step out where there is enough innovation happening. Um, you know, continue to invest in public goods and infrastructure, invest a lot more in customer protection. Uh, maybe this time we start to talk about having a unified customer regulator across all financial services. That, that, that's a big yeah. gap in our architecture today. Right, Natasha, uh, again, you know, having, uh, so having uh, the, the grievance uh, redressal mechanisms or even having a, a regulator who's protecting the customer these are all excellent steps again but it does come back to awareness so um, looking at the if, if somebody had to give advice to the finance minister would one of the things be to say look we've invested a lot in building up this entire infrastructure and it's great we have a fantastic india stack when it comes to finance do invest money in awareness in just spreading the word of how you should be doing a b and c that's good and a valuable investment to make probably doesn't cost that much have those, those awareness campaigns because that's how you really spread financial inclusion. Follow the infrastructure with awareness about how you use the infrastructure. Vikram, I would say yes, uh, but I would go even a step beyond. So I think uh, investing in awareness, super important, right? But I think there are certain things needed in the architecture to also enable awareness to not just be spread directly to the customer, but to enable those assisted channels that we've been talking about. And I think that's change I would love. I think a nudge is from the central government, from the RBI, to say that, you know, every one of these technologies that is being made available should also be available to, you know, that entire, uh, you know, 600 to 800 million, which is sort of, you know, uh, not urban, not formal sector customers. I think so. I would say it's two parts. One is to really uh, create awareness. Second is to really make every single investment available both directly as well as in assisted mode. Okay. Tara, if I could just come to some specific areas such as gender equality, for example. I mean, we're talking about financial inclusion it's really critical to make sure that the gender gap is also bridged. And to be fair, we've made a lot of progress uh, when, it, when, it, when it comes to this. Is there a risk that as this infrastructure is more and more, and more in, by, by the household, is there a danger that increasingly, especially in rural areas and other places, you have the men of the household and others saying, no, no, this is very complicated. Give me the phone. I will figure out how to do the payments. Uh, and, and that drives back that goal towards having greater... Uh, gender gender equality. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is, uh, you know, aspects like this and the use of technology can actually help women entrepreneurs, for example. Uh, which way do you think it will fall? Because from what I can make out, there are two things that you want me to answer. One is about men taking over um, the digital uh, uh, applications. But one thing you must remember, whether it is West Bengal, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, it is a lot of in the lower economic people, it's the women who are working more than the men do. Unfortunately, if you see even the buys and all who come to your house, most of their husbands are either sitting drunk. So it's the women who are bringing in the money. So I think that kind of uh, financial independence is going to push these women to do what they want to do. But yes, again, as I say that this awareness of having everybody um, aware of what is happening is important because what should be told to panchayat heads in smaller villages is that boss it's all right if the head of the family is handling it but kal utke kuch hua aapko what happens to the family so i think that you know awareness that kind of education has to be again like we talk about gender equality see gender equality is such a huge subject vikram there are various reasons why there is no equality and I think, again, you know, to go back to what I don't remember the person who said it about India and Bharat, I think we're still struggling with India and Bharat. Unlike other countries, there's a huge gap. But I think gender equality is taking precedent. I think there are lots of uh, 
institutions, lots of walks of life, whether it's financial, whether it's ministry, you have lots of women. But yes, there are certain areas where women, maybe because historically they wanted to be protected or maybe they thought they were not good enough, starting with real estate, infrastructure, women have found it very difficult. And that is the reason why we have started Mahi. As I said, I'm the president of Mahi, which is a women <clears throat> platform for women entrepreneurs in real estate and infrastructure. If more of these platforms are made available where women can come, we can be the wind beneath their wings. Lots of women have uh, dreams, but they don't know where to go to. So I think that kind of platforms, if they can have across, whether privately or the government assisted, I think that'll be a great thing. All right, uh, uh, that, that uh, interesting point of view. But if I could just turn to you, other areas where uh, of business now, not so much the households where um, you know it is possible that technology could play a role. Let's, for example, look at look at the access to credit. Uh, you know, look at MSMEs, for example, which have often found it much tougher. To get loans than a than a giant company um, is technology going to do, to your view is it going to be is technology going to make a difference in that also or no 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 I'll tell you what I think technology will facilitate things but it can't do things for you okay fair enough Bindu same qu that question to you yeah and I think uh, credit is a bit of a different issue um, I mean in credit you are fundamentally dealing with sort of the information problem of if I lend to this person will the money come back which is a very different nature than payments which is more sort of a, a unilateral transaction if you will uh, so technology definitely has a role to play in re reducing transaction costs for example Vikram I think one of the things we don't understand is that for, let's say, a bank, um, any kind of branch based model for them to make a small loan, uh, the just the operating costs of making a small loan are very high. So, you know, it's it's a challenging context where technology, for example, can definitely play a role in bringing that down. However, you have to simultaneously also solve the information problem. Um, and that's where I think in general, there is enthusiasm about saying um, newer models, innovations that go away from looking at collateral um, assets, which by definition only work for those who have assets. Uh, but let's look at underwriting based on past history, behavior, um, and digital models enable you to do that sort of better um, than old style collateral based lending. So the whole success of microfinance, for example, is that it completely did away with collateral. Um, it only relied on the assurance of other members in the group that I'm good for the credit. Um, that was a core insight for which Professor Yunus got the Nobel Prize and lots of people took that to scale. Um, I think we are very much looking forward to similar insights uh, from digital players. But I think just a note to say there, in addition to technology, we have to also solve for the information problem. But I'm All right. All right. Let me let me get the others' views. And that, Natasha, your 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 view. I mean, like inclusion goes go. There are many aspects to inclusion and provision of credit, for example, becomes an important part of it. Uh, the difficulty that smaller companies, small entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs sometimes have of getting loans or in rural areas. Uh, if you look at a farmer, the, the, look at the if, if a farmer is running into debt, look, yeah, quite often he or she have to go to local money lenders, get money at some extortionate, ridiculous rate. You could go and buy, if you're in the city, you could go and buy a Mercedes at a low interest, low interest rate. Uh, you know, the farmers don't have access to that. These are aspects of inclusion that I, I just wonder whether technology could help solve for. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I feel that one of, you know, the big reason why MSMEs or smaller players, in my mind, don't, you know, don't get easier access to credit is because there is a, uh, you know, there isn't an understanding, as Bindu also said, of, you know, how will somebody repay back? the loan that goes to the crux as, as she said of getting credit i do think that you know there are many things that can be done here that are driven by technology so you know i think we already have availability of gst data e invoicing data e way bills you know this sort of in many ways defines the day in and day out cash flow of a business which in many ways can help 
you know, allow building models and uh, the ability to really, you know, have a you know, use past transaction data, use past behavior of that business, of that individual to really predict, uh, you know, future both, you know, ability to pay as well as propensity to pay. And, you know, really also start uh, te teasing those apart because those are both important factors. And I think for us, you know, I think uh, at Kaleidofin, we're building something called Chi-Score, which is really it goes to the heart of this, right? It's the ability of scoring. We, we've started with individuals first to see how do you uh, score a customer in this informal sector who is otherwise either doesn't have a credit score or has such a low credit score that it's very often not useful in the, in you know by for for use by a bank. But really tease that apart to a more detailed score that takes into account data that is available. And how do we, of course, we were taking this now to smaller businesses. We want to take it further. But I think making this kind of data uh, available via technology with a very strong consent-based mechanism, and that's really, again, what goes to the heart of what account aggregator is trying to do. I think some of these moves are totally the right direction because it gives the MSME owner the control over, do I give access to my data to then allow somebody to take a call on giving me credit uh, again will bring in the fact that you know enabling this again in assisted channels uh, is a great way to build in that awareness that this mm -hmm. is available to them so how do we do that but i think there's a huge role technology can and should play in this all right um Rishi, just looking at other innovations that may be around the corner. I mean, you know, I, and again, I'm now trying to move this to now policy prescriptions that we could perhaps suggest uh, if the finance minister is watching this, which uh, uh, no doubt she is. Uh, you know, what what are the what are the sort of recommendations that can be made? What are the innovations that are around the corner that should be encouraged that can make a, a major dent in in solving the problems around inclusion? I think a lot of innovation has happened over the last few years, especially the account aggregator, the open platform, the offline transaction platform, which the regulator is now starting to promote uh, the 200 rupee withdrawal without uh, uh, online verification is another thing. I think a lot of innovation is is happened. I think what we need to look at, I think the regulator needs to, or the government needs to, uh, let the let the actors play on the ground and not over uh, regulate is what I would agree uh, to what Bindu was saying earlier. I think let the market uh, find its own steam. Let the let the customers decide uh, what kind of platform and what kind of technology interventions they require. I think from my own lens, the way I look at, I think our government, our regulator, the uh, NPCI, a lot of other platforms have done a fantastic job in making those things available. Now, some of those things have just started to come out in the market, like account aggregator or Okin or other platforms which we are talking about. Let it play over the next couple of years. Let us see how uh, things uh, will happen. On the policy side, I would say coming from a payments bank, uh, I would probably use this opportunity to talk about the fact that we are overly uh, regulated by a lot of uh, some some kind of handicaps or restrictions which are there if 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 the finance minister and the rbi is listening to this uh, my request is that if we can open up the payments bank uh, platform a little bit more uh, that will help us to deepen financial inclusion help us to make credit available uh, to the last mile because we already have the network uh, there on the ground so from a policy side, I think uh, there is some uh, interventions which can be done by the regulators, uh, spe specifically making things possible and easy. I am also seeing uh, that there is, seems to be some kind of a, a fintech uh, growth which has happened and the regulator is also trying to bring some kind of light regulation onto the fintech platform. I think that's a right step. As you also said earlier, that uh, there could be some smart players, there could be some people who might uh, jeopardize the entire growth and become bad actors, uh, like we saw in case of some of the other applications or apps, uh, especially on the credit side. So some kind of light regulation uh, will help the system. Personally, I have always believed 
that uh, regulation is uh, is a good thing uh, to work on because you know you know your boundary conditions and you work within that right now a uh, lot of sectors don't have any boundaries and uh, it may yeah. dampen them if tomorrow regulations come and spoil their uh, uh, okay. play so regulation from bending especially uh, on fintech uh, on a light basis would be a good direction which i think the regulator is already talking about those are few things uh, chandra comes to my mind top of my mind in terms of what we need to do my personal thing is that uh, we should let the market decide things and let the people decide consumers decide the way they want to do business and they want to transact uh, rather than pushing things so what the government need to make is get the ecosystem in place which they have done so well in the last few years okay get the ecosystem in place tara looking at real estate specifically which is you know, of course an area of, of great expertise of yours um this is one place where many believe that you could actually take some further steps about setting up certain systems so setting up the ecosystem in a greater manner i mean obvious things like you know the digitization of land records and the ability to use that that would suddenly throw open for so many millions and millions of people the ability to use their land as collateral to not have to sell it to be able to get loans against it to be able to develop it is that an important area where you think um, you know perhaps a finance minister and others should turn their attention to uh, there have been a number of scams in other areas in the real estate area can technology be used out there what would be your specific policy um, suggestions right now you know right now i think what is happening unfortunately in our country and i'm sure it's world over the poorest of poor who really need funding for building a home are not getting cheap funds institutions like mine which is jm financial home loans limited which does for affordable housing we are having a huge problem getting long term cheap finance which we can on lend what happens is when other institutions who are looking at our company to lend to us think ours is a very risky business because we are giving it to the unorganized sector so to say so you know cheap funds are not available and whereas people who have credentials who've got loans who've got enough to back they are getting cheaper funds i think if they the government could make uh, hfis and banks priority lending is there but again cheaper long term funds because generally there's always a mismatch between the asset and the liability in all these organizations more than you know and then technology will be used but more than that i want um the finance minister to make some kind of fund available you know there is a swami fund which is for developers to for the last mile funding but more than that actual users should be allowed to get cheaper funds that's what i'm looking for all right is there anything particular you're looking for um, whether it is uh, suggestions for fixing the ecosystem whether it is you know the government helping uh, institutions overcome any challenges that they might be facing such as whatever the rules and the regulations are how do you get out to the rural populations how do you provide collateral what would be your suggestions yeah just a couple of things one i think uh, the role of uh, small non bank finance companies i think in the overall financial inclusion is critical because they are the ones who are the last mile between the end customer whether it's a micro enterprise or a pharma household and the banking system now what's happened in the last 2 3 years you know has been that that channel has gotten really squeezed so if you look at the ltro program uh, that was launched as a covid management response and there were several versions of that less than 10% i think of the total ltro funding actually went to small and mid sized nbfcs um so there's been a real squeeze as far as liquidity is concerned and the reason that's important is then their ability to lend to the last mile um whether it is small businesses or individuals becomes heavily constrained and as we look to get out of uh, i think the covid effects it's really important to get this liquidity channel going uh, and transmission going so there's a lot that rbi and the government are doing in terms of pumping liquidity but it's not sort of transmitting through um and that's where i would really urge deeper thinking around 
how do we free up um, particularly the non-deposit taking NBFCs who are critical. Uh, the other point I'll make around where I hope there will be some rethink reflection is um, specific categories, uh, farm insurance, so your Fasal Bhima Yojana, uh, your health insurance, Aishman Bharat. Uh, so these are all schemes that have good thinking. Unfortunately, there I think the bias has been towards too much sort of control and underfunding. Uh, so if you look at the Fasal Bhima Yojana, uh, it's pretty much in that sense crowded out a lot of potential private sector activity, what insurers could be doing. And the scheme itself is not performing well in terms of claims, payouts, etc. So it would be wonderful if there could be a rethink in terms of in some of these categories, how can government play more of an enabler role, um, get more entrants, get more innovation going, be solidly focused on protecting the customer from bad conduct, but perhaps not um, be in the fray themselves. Uh, and Ayushman Bharat, I think, is a really interesting idea, very underfunded and limited only to a certain section of the population. COVID has shown us how vulnerable most of uh, India is. Can we not have a version of this where perhaps people contribute to premium? I don't think government has to pay for everything, but can the infrastructure of Ayushman Bharat, particularly the NHA uh, and all that be made available to a broader group of people? I think uh, that's really important to my mind. Natasha, um, I think this, this government likes the schemes and likes the ability to push things through directly to the last mile. And it's happened successfully in some areas like Swachh Bharat and others less successfully in other areas. What do you think they should be doing? Um, stay away and do low touch or, or, or actually get involved directly? No, a great question. And, you know, first off, I would say that fully agree with many of the suggestions made by the previous panelists. So I, I will, uh, you know, focus on not repeating those, but big, big plus one to many of these suggestions. I think it will really help this section of the, you know, customer segment. I think one thing which maybe I'll... Uh, use the time to bring up is, uh, you know, I think from a customer trust building and customer protection perspective, I think what we have observed, and this is very specific on the ground, but I think if the government could play a role in encouraging consistent behavior around this, it would help. So I'll give you an example, right? We're trying to encourage customers to use digital payments. We are trying to encourage them to make repayments for credit, say, for example, right? So uh, customers do come in and make their monthly payment into their bank account, uh, you know, say a thousand, two thousand rupees. And what often happens today is that there are several deductions made by banks in this uh, as soon as the deposit comes in. That could be towards a standardized insurance scheme. It could be, uh, you know, because there was some penalty uh, that needed to be applied. And we've seen a lot of these uh, come through. You know, we've literally observed customer bank accounts when we get, uh, you know, grievance requests. And it is quite, uh, you know, just highly unintuitive for a customer who feels they've made their EMI payment on time. And then they find out that 200 rupees or 300 rupees has been deducted for a penalty that is you know, they may not even have understood. And it very drastically, you know, reduces the trust on the ground for this customer who will then very be, be much more careful about doing this, you know, in the future. And so if we could do a lot more around the kinds of penalties that are applied by banks and especially focus on this sector to create bank accounts that are, you know, far more um, friendly, and uh, don't have very high bounce charges or very high penalties and are much easier to understand actually you know transparent to the customer where it's not it doesn't come as a surprise i think it would make a huge difference uh so that right. that's one thing yeah all right i think we're nearly out of time but i'm going to just perhaps get one a uh, one liner from each of you to end this Vikram, if i um, can just add to natasha you know if, sure, if, it's, yeah. if it's okay with you yeah, yeah, sure. So, Natasha, you don't need to look any further. We are there to solve your problem. Uh, we we are probably the only bank in India which is offering subscription-based uh, savings account. And we open accounts in lakhs every month. And uh, there are no penalties. There are no hidden charges. You just pay one, one time in a year, one day, you pay one amount. And there are no other charges. So, customers will not get deducted any. 
<laughs> we'll allow the two of so you to speak online. Happy to help we'll you. allow the two of you to speak <laughs> offline about this. All right, one line from each of you to end this. One thing which you would like to hear in the budget. Tara, why don't you start? One, one line which you would be really happy to hear in the budget. Hello? Yeah. Tara, I'm not being able to hear you. Abolish okay, income tax. <laughs> Abolish income tax. Okay, yes, fine. That's what I'd like to hear. All right, fine. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure you're going to get that, but let's see. Who knows? Uh, well, Bindu, you, uh, you, you, like you ask me to ask. So you know, if yeah. you ask for something, you might get. Yeah. Well, <laughs> more predictably, in my case, I think just more focus on customer protection. More focus on customer protection, Natasha. For me, I think uh, ensure that every framework that is set up for uh, you know any kind of financial access has assisted mode as well. Okay, assisted mode. Uh, Rishi? So I would say that if, uh, if especially deepening financial inclusion or financial services is given an infrastructure kind of a status and there are some kind of uh, uh, some kind of uh, grants or benefits which can come to this ecosystem to deepen the infrastructure. I think infrastructure is something which we need to focus on. If something of that sort can be made available on tax ops or anything else to banks and institutions, they can use the same money to uh, deepen the financial infrastructure in the country. Uh, that would be something good. And I agree with Tara, we need to move to consumption-based tax rather than income tax. But I don't think that would happen so soon. Ask All for right. it. Ask for it. Don't say it won't hope, happen. <laughs> hope, hope springs eternal. Who knows? We it might might surprise everybody. Uh, if, personally, I doubt it in this budget, but who knows? But I think one other lesson that I, I've taken from all all the experts over the last uh, hour or so is it's really it's there's a lot of work being done in spreading the infrastructure in setting up the ecosystem around financial inclusion. One of the areas that I think a certain amount of work still needs to be done is spreading awareness and education. And that might therefore be something which the government needs to do because everyone may have the access to the institutions around, uh, to financial institutions. Do they know how to use it effectively? Do they know what they should be watchful for? That might be one of the things that uh, the government wants to turn, it, turn its attention to. And with that, we are at the end of this session. Vikram, to, uh, Vikram before we close, can I just... Yeah. Uh, um, quote Franklin D. Roosevelt. Sure. Yeah. yeah. The test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. I think that's I think that's a great quote, and I'm sure that's one of the things which, especially after so many after two years of COVID, I'm sure that's one of the things the finance minister will will keep in mind. Thank you so much for joining us. It was Thank great you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice Thank day. You.